Yes, this is us again. Just a minute. Okay. okay cool. Wait a minute. I have to accept the call first, all right? Okay. All right, here we go. All right, and? Who are you? Lou, you ready to speak? One? Everybody's listening quietly. I just wanted to say thank you all, brothers, sisters, friends, for coming out today. I just want to do a few things. Uh, to let you all know that if you ever read any of the legal briefs in the past, in the last few years, and you found them compelling or well done or even interesting, the two lawyers, the two women that you're meeting tonight, wrote them. And if you've seen oral arguments in the last few years, you've no doubt been impressed by their mastery of the issues, cases, and the material. Um, you've met them, you know them. Uh, I really just want to welcome them again from the NAACP LDF, Christina Swartz, and law professor Judith Ritter. Welcome to you both. As do I, thank you, welcome, and thank you. And thank you. <laughs> Lou? Lou, man? Yes, yes. Yeah, the lawyers got a, an uncommon reception for lawyers. Let me tell you, this crowd gave them the warmest reception possible. So you just, you should know that you're following on that. We have some people who want to ask you questions, okay? All right, here we go. Hi, Lumia. My name is Nina Saxon. I represent the Riverside Prison Ministry. My question is, how do we get young people into the struggle? All right. <laughs> I, I tell you this. Um, there are so many problems facing the country, and not just the black community, but the nation as whole, that this should be the easiest time in the world to get people involved. If it isn't, it's just because they're involved in something else or they feel as if they can't make a difference. But once you explain to them that if they don't get involved and try to change the situation, it can only get worse and worse for them and for their children. And their grandchildren. So if they get involved, they can't change the world. Absolutely. They have to get involved. I'm tweeting it now. Go ahead, next question. My old man, this is Gwen. I've written you a number of times, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just overjoyed to hear your voice. I want to personally say, um, but the question I want to ask you is, what, do you, what lessons can be taken from young people about the election of uh, Barack Hussein Obama? I could make out what she said. Neither could I. I think we had a little audio problem. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, okay, I'm going to repeat it. Um, first, I want to say thank you again for responding um, to my letters that I've written you. Okay, again, this is Gwen, and I just want to ask you, what lessons can young people learn from the election of Barack Hussein Obama? What, what, what do you think? Could you hear it that time? I did hear you. Okay, your favorite, one of your favorite questions. Uh, well, that, um, that politics is never over on election night. Um, a lot of people kind of felt like they achieved, especially young people, and let's not think it, black people. A lot of people felt that they had made history, that this was a different country, that this really was a different world. And unfortunately, what they found out in the last year or two is it, it's a whole lot like it was before. It is true that the President of the United States is intelligent and, and literate and many of the things that the former President wasn't. It's also true that many of the same problems that we faced and that people around the world face uh, continue to plague us and them. And in fact, in some instances, have gotten worse. So I think that people should learn that um, election night is not the end, it's the beginning. If people had begun then, that is in November, I think, what, 2008, to protest and to demonstrate and to speak their minds, well, we might not uh, be involved in a new war. Uh, people might have gotten some of the benefits of all those billions and trillions of dollars that went to Wall Street. Maybe, maybe they could have gone to schools instead who really need the money. Uh, people have forgotten, I think, that protests make differences. Uh, they've forgotten the role of social movements. 
movements. Social movements changed American history. In many places, they changed world history. Uh, once we remember that, then we're able to begin to change uh, uh, history as it is now and create a better future. This one from the state correctional institution at monitoring and quitting. I am on Esperanza and Mumia talk to us about imperialism and colonialism and the fight back. You said colonialism? Yeah. Imperialism and colonialism and the fight back. We have six hours to listen. Imperialism and colonialism and the fight back. Well, we're living, frankly, in a neo-colonial era. Um, and I say, I say that internationally, not just nationally. Um, that's what Libya is about. That's what um, many of the struggles around the world are about. Because yeah. people are resisting and fighting back against neo-colonial leaders. You know, people... When I was 14, I had the pleasure, it was really my job, I was ordered to do it. I had the duty to read uh, Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. Great book. I uh, commend it to any of you. It's a hard book to read, but it's necessary because he teaches us all uh, the price if governments are neo-colonial, if they do not truly fight for political and economic independence and liberation. And because many African countries didn't do it, and because many Arab countries didn't do it, well, now we see the price 30, 35, 40 years later. Um, all of those governments were uh, puppets of the West. Uh, the most brutal in the world are actually puppets of the West, or puppets of Europe, or pu puppets of the U.S., or puppets of capital. What they are not are truly independent leaders uh, ruling in the best interest of their people. They're ruling in the best interest of their own profit. That's why you saw such vast and huge corruption, let's say, in the presidency of Egypt, where, you know, one family has most of the wealth in the whole country. Well, you know, that's colonialism. That's neo-colonialism. That's real. That's imperialism. Because they would rather pay off a hitman like Mubarak or any of these other people over there that really spread the wealth among the people and really develop the society for the betterment of the average person living over there. So you have vast wealth in one family or, say, one small class, and you have great poverty and joblessness for the majority of the people. Well, that's a recipe for rebellion and revolution. So we're looking at that all around the world. My brother, this is Brother Bullwhip, brother. How you doing? My question, what is the strategies, what are the strategies do you propose for the grassroots to help you in your freedom? Um, organize, organize, organize. Most people who have been around a few years recognize that that's a quote from Kwame Touré, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael. Every time he spoke, whether it was in Atlanta, Georgia, or Albany, Georgia, or Mississippi or Philadelphia, West Africa. He spoke those words. And truer words were rarely spoken. Organized, organized, organized. Uh, I know that a lot of younger people think this is the Facebook generation or the Twitter generation. Well, those are tools. And truth be told, they're very important tools. They can do a whole lot of things that people could not do in 1966 or 1968 or 1970 or 1985. But guess what? The best way to organize is to sit down and talk to people and not through a machine but face to face and to spend time with people. And um, while you don't think you have that time, I bet you're doing a whole lot more, you know, uh, playing video games <laughs> or something like that uh, than talking to people. And uh, that's a powerful, powerful organizing tool. Mm -hmm. Hey, yo, my brother. Um, my name is Ref. I'm a hip-hop artist in a rap group called Circa 95 out of New York City. Um, and, and my question was, I want you to speak a little bit about the revolutionary legacy that artists in general, but hip-hop hip specifically, has um, to keep alive. You know what I'm saying? Well, 
artists. Well, like many art forms that have been created by black folks in the last, even the last century, um, they have been co-opted. That is, they have been captured by corporate interests. And the most radical and the most progressive art forms have rarely been heard. Uh, if you're talking about something other than uh, your blame, or your thing on how many cars you got, how many bitches you got. Well, you're not going to make it on BET or MTV or VH1 or anything like that. And that's a corporate kind of cutout and shutout of a certain kind of music because, you know, music is a powerful, powerful thing. We forget about it sometimes because, you know, as black people, for the most part, we're surrounded by it all day long. Uh, when black people were marching and facing off against terrorism in the South, in the Civil Rights Movement, uh, every step they took was accompanied by a song. We call them uh, Negro Spirituals. But they refreshed and emboldened and inspired many, many young people to stand up against, you know, uh, dogs that were attacking them, and water hoses and, and blackjacks and prison and all of those kinds of things. So music has a power that we must all uh, pay attention to. And I would say that, you know, for those young people who are hip-hop artists, just inject the truth, the resistance of the people, the history of the people into your music, and you'll make it timeless. You'll make it something that people will listen to years from now, not just, you know, the, the next hot hit. Make it worthy of something. Put some truth in it. Greetings, Mumia. My name is Bob Letterer. I'm with Resistance in Brooklyn. And first, I just want to say what a, what a great honor it is for me to speak to you after being inspired by your commentaries and books for all these years. And my question is about all of that incredible productivity and brilliance that, is, that has emanated from your, your cell on death row for coming up on 30 years, and you're, you're now approaching your 57th birthday. What has kept your spirit strong? What has kept you going through all of the, the heartaches that you've witnessed and through missing a lot of the, the growth and development of your children and grandchildren? How do you stay strong? Well, thanks for that question, Bob. Uh, I mean, it, uh, I, it has been a long, hard struggle. Um, I have been blessed, and I am blessed, with a loving family. Um, You've heard what the is, my children, grandchildren, um, but people like you as well. You know, um, I'm inspired when. This call is from the State Correctional Institution at Green and is subject to monitoring and recording. I'm inspired when I see people uh, organize, take action, and uh, resist against the forces of imperialism and colonialism and neocolonialism. And we see that all around the world. Just the reaction that we got when we, we can hear y'all. We can hear y'all cheering for us just to know that we're on the phone together. Right. That's, 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 it, that's inspirational. That was a beautiful thing. It really was. Well, maybe uh, the clock is run out. <laughs> oh, and like Thank you. Know. Okay, Mamiya, Ralph here for Lynn Stewart. No question, but we are with you. We will not fail you. We dare not fail you. We dare not fail you. <laughs>